Hey, my name is Drew and you're not going to want to miss the gear in this video. I had no idea most of this gear even existed until I met Pat during my trip across Oregon with Atlas. I knew Pat through the Playing With Sticks community and exchanges and emails, but now I get the chance to meet Pat in person. I pulled into his place with the teardrop in tow and the first thing I noticed, his patio is just covered in camping gear. You should have seen us and Pat's wife could attest to this. We looked like two kids in a candy shop just discussing gear. Here's a product from MC Ranch uh, Overland. We use it for a couple of different things. Uh, one of the coolest things about it is it's very portable. You open it up and you just swing it out. And now you have a fire reflective wall. If you put your fire pit right here, when you sit in front of it, uh, it throws the heat back at you. It also helps keep the uh, wind off your fire. And we found that extremely useful. This is a wood pellet fire pit uh, made by Innostage. They are one of many different manufacturers of fire pits that look exactly like this. I can't tell you who the patent holder is. There must not be one since so many different people make them. The first place I saw it was uh, Duraflame, I think, makes them. And what you do with this is you put wood pellets in it and it creates a smokeless, warm, very warm, fire that comes out of it. If you uh, do a Google search on InnoStage or Duraflame, you can see what I'm talking about. They're very, very cool. And what's super nice is carrying, carrying with you a lot of wood, very bulky, very heavy. With this, you just carry a bag of wood pellets. 20 pound bag will last six hours, I think, of fire, depending on you know how, mu how much you feed it. If you decide to go out and pick up one of these, there's something that you need to know. The first time that I used this fire pit, for about the first 10 minutes, it was amazing. It was uh, uh, 10 minutes of perfect fire, no smoke, exactly as advertised. After about the first 10 minutes, maybe 15 at most, uh, the fire went out. And as a fire goes out, as you would normally do, you would, would add some more wood to it to catch it back on fire, or you might even blow in it to get the embers going and get the wood caught back on fire. This doesn't work that way. I was not able to keep the fire running the first time that I used it, and when I came back from my camping trip, I was going to return it. I was so upset. It had so much potential, but in the end, it failed me. Once I got home and did some more research on YouTube, I found out that actually I failed it. If I had followed the instructions precisely, I would have understood more about the concept behind this. And the concept is that the wood chips themselves smolder and they produce gases and it's the gases that are igniting around these holes here which is why it's a smokeless fire pit if you buy one you'll need to find that sweet spot to when you need to feed pellets and you need to feed pellets every five to ten minutes to keep the fire going but you're rewarded with pure fire and a lot of heat and extreme portability how much would you say that weighs i can see the size oh because uh, it's aluminum? 10 pounds. Okay. Yeah, or less. This is a product made by a company called Fireside, and it's called the uh, Pop-Up Pit and it's a pop-up fire pit. It has a heat reflective blanket that can go on the underside of this and on the commercials if you if you google it you'll see that they're able to build a fire in here sitting on top of a cloth table. So it's very interesting and you can use these too if you're out in the wild and you're worried about catching things on fire uh, this could help you prevent that. Otherwise you build a fire in this like you would any other fire pit and uh, the, the base of this is just steel wire mesh or steel mesh. And you can see through it and so it breathes really well and we've gotten a lot of good use out of this. We have an add-on to the product that we showed you earlier. See if you can figure out what it is as I put it together.
figured out yet. If you guessed barbecue pit, you'd be correct. So what this will let you do is to barbecue over the top of your fire and you can uh, set this over to the side. Uh, you can create some embers over here. You can make marshmallows. You can have hot dogs or steaks cooking over here. You can move this over depending on where the, the hot embers are. So it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, and the ability to, to barbecue outside right over your, your portable fire pit. And what are we thinking weight for all of this? What would you guess? Five pounds. Whoa. Very light. What we have here is uh, the first ground steak that I had with the trailer. The other thing that we got at the same time was these springs. And if you've never used springs with your guy wires when you, when you have it staked down, I would recommend that you give them a try because what they do is it gives you flexibility in your line. So when you're dealing with high winds and your awning or your tents are trying to blow over, if you have these, uh, uh, these springs, it'll give the guy wire some flexibility to move without breaking. It'll, make, it'll give a much uh, firmer connection to the ground for whatever it is you're attaching. The next thing that we went to, because we needed to go to the next thing, <clears throat> was ground stakes by a company named Ground Grabba. And if you've heard of them, you know their reputation in the industry. Where these are fantastic in very firm ground, if the ground isn't quite as firm as you can imagine, these are just going to pull right up. It's got very fine uh, threading on it. This is very coarse threaded and it's much thicker. These will screw down into the ground and then they have along with them these attachment points. So if you drive this into the ground, you put this onto it, and then you hook that to whatever you're you're trying to tie down. And would you drive that in with a drill? With a drill, yeah. And it has on the other end of it, it has a little tool so that you can manually tighten it if you want to. Seems tedious to me, never used it, but it's there nonetheless. So those are typically the two ground uh, uh, um, stakes that we use. But we did come across a situation where we needed a third type of ground stake. And those are over here. Sand. Anybody tried to go to the beach and screw their stuff into the sand? So we got these bad boys. And these work fantastic. We've been to the beach in 30, 35 knot winds and the awning on the trailer has been just rock solid. They're very amazing. Very expensive. These are uh, roughly eight dollars a piece. You might be able to find them on special. They might be a little bit more by the time you go to check on them, but roughly eight dollars a piece. For these, they're about fourteen dollars a piece. Very cool products. Very expensive. Very necessary when you're trying to tie your stuff down. So what you have here is a trash can. What you do is you put the trash bag or the trash liner, if you will, underneath this lip and, and the, belt, the, um, the bungee strips help hold it down. And by drilling a hole in the bottom of it, it helps hold the whole thing together so that you can move it around without worrying about it coming apart. And then what you wind up with is a trash bag with a lid. So what is it? What did you make this out of? Uh, this is sold, I don't remember the, the name of the company. Uh, we can get that and you can include it in your uh, in the description of the video. Oh, so but, this isn't something you invented. This is something we can buy. That's right. You can buy this. Now, the modifications that I made to it, I drilled these two holes in the bottom so that I could put the uh, bungee strips on there because what was happening to us was as soon as you put a garbage sack in here and you get any weight in it and you're working over by the by the kitchen 
and then you go to move this thing when you lift it up it frequently will come apart so the bungees help keep it together and it gives you a nice tight fitting uh, lid to for your garbage what we became very frustrated over was those uh, garbage cans I'm sure most people use that like zip open right and then you put your trash in and you got to zip it back closed So let's talk trailer security for just a second. For the times that we park this at a base camp and want to drive away and want to make sure that the trailer is, is extra secure is this Covix lock. And what it is, it's a lock that's extraordinarily rugged and it has an alarm system in it. So what you do is you lock this up and this piece here will go up inside of the, the receiver and it locks through. You can see how thick it is and it has a battery and an alarm system built into it. So even if somebody comes up and just attempts to pick the lock or to cut the lock or to use a hammer to cut the lock off, uh, it, its built-in alarm system will sound. Alright, let's talk charging options. Uh, for people that go to RV or uh, RV sites or at campgrounds, uh, I don't know how many of you have had this particular issue, but I've ran into it one time and I hope to never run into it again. I thought I'd share lessons learned with you. For me, in my trailer, my trailer is a 30 amp uh, trailer. So this is the dongle that plugs into my 30 amp uh, uh, circuit. Now, normally I could simply buy a 30 amp cord, plug it into the trailer, and then plug the other end into the 30 amp service in the campground or the RV park. But I need to carry with me a 30 amp cable on both ends that will give me 30 amp service. Some campsites only have a 50 amp service available. In that case I would need to carry both a 30 amp cable and a 50 amp cable that's this downscaled to 30 amp. Sometimes they only have 15 amp service so you see where I'm going with this. It wasn't something that I had anticipated. So this is my dongle, goes in 30, uh, 30 amp service. Coming out the other end is a normal three prong 110. So the way that I work my trailer is, I have one cord, one end of the cord plugs into the dongle, this end of the cord plugs into the 15 amp service that, that's coming out of the, the trailer park. Now, if they don't have 15 amp service, let's say they only have 30 amp service, I have an, ex an, an adapter. This will plug into the 30 amp service. Still, my three prong cord plugs into it, and now I'm running my trailer off of 110. It downscales it. I have exactly the same thing for the 50 amp service. Three prong plug on the other side plug it in. Now I can run off of 50 amp service. All of it downscaled and running into the same dongle, the same cord, and by the way this is also the same cord that I use to run off of my generator. So now I have one cord and I can plug into four sources of power. One of the benefits of going to a solar blanket and spending ridiculous amounts of money over a solar panel is that it folds down to an, into a very small size. So solar panels are great. I have two of them on the trailer and I use them uh, to charge up a Jackery. These produce uh, three times as much power and in a very small footprint that I can throw in the back seat of my vehicle. I can throw it in the uh, floorboard of the trailer. This is the Red Arc. 240 watt uh, solar blanket. One of the challenges that we had in trying to run all of the gadgets that we need to run, and keep in mind we're not trying to recreate our living room out in the bush, but my wife does have a CPAP machine, and we have some other things that we do out in the field that we like to have power for. Uh, we found ourselves a little bit challenged to keep the trailer charged. So I went out and purchased this ridiculous thing for $1,600 
which isn't a good deal. But it's a cool product. It is durable. What you'll find out on the market is that a lot of solar panels are not super durable. Uh, the surface material on them will crack pretty easily and it will decrease the solar output if you even get the rated solar output to begin with. But you don't have to spend $1,600 like I did. Uh, so what this panel does is we put it together in such a way that, uh, or we use it in such a way that we're able to keep the trailer charged, but the big challenge to it was, where do I put it? This big thing, it's hard to hold. Wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Everybody talks about putting them on the windshield of their vehicles. They talk about hanging them off of trees, which is great, but you can't chase the sun that way. That'll be good for about 15 minutes of the day and then you're getting less than optimal sun. So what I wanted was some kind of a support system that I could lay this down on and be able to move around and kind of chase the sun. So you remember these pieces and parts that I dropped on the ground? This is the support system that I came up with to support the solar blanket. The least expensive thing I've ever done. So when I put this thing together, there were a couple of particular challenges that I needed to overcome. One, I needed to be able to move it around in order to chase the sun, in order to get the most out of it. You can glue ends together, but you have to leave some ends open so that it remains portable. And so what I came up with was I used uh, bungee cords to hold the pieces together that tend to pull apart. So when I move the panel, all I have to do is lift it and spin it around like this. You can uh, create more of an angle if you want to. You can you can lay it down as, as far as you want to. You can even, even lay it flat if it makes sense to you. Here's the back side of it. I know it's cobbled together, don't laugh, but it's cheap. It's probably the cheapest thing I've did and it gets the job done. I got a better one for you. Oh, it's a backpack. Huh. Interesting. So what we just set up is Starlink, uh, but it's Starlink for RV. So some of you may or may not be aware of what Starlink is. It's a series of satellites. Right now there's between 2,700 and 3,000 of these satellites. Uh, and the idea is that there will always be a satellite somewhere overhead. Right now the United States is completely covered, but sparsely. So your internet speeds are going to vary. My speeds right here where I'm at vary between 5 megabits per second and I've gotten all the way up to 120 but it's all over the place in between there so I can take this with me anywhere in the country anywhere in the world really and as long as it can get uh, communicate with the satellite I can get internet where I'm, wherever I'm at by the way I can also use it to uh, supplement my house so when I lose power I've already taken this and connected to the router inside my house and I can provide my house internet if I need to as well. Did you mention with the RV package you can turn it on, turn it off? Good point. Yeah, thanks Drew. Uh, so the RV package, the other uh, big benefit in it is that not only can you take it wherever you want to, but you can turn the service on and off. So if you want to use it in July, you turn it on. You use If you use it one time in July, it costs the same as if you use it every day in July. But then in August, if you're not going to need it, then you don't have to pay for the August subscription. You can turn it on and off as many times as you want to throughout the year. If you thought this gear was unique, check out this video. There's seven pieces of camping equipment in this video you probably have never seen before. And as usual, make sure you take time to enjoy this big, beautiful world and stay safe out there.